First of all, we have to understand what we mean by Christians. Not everyone who says they're a Christian is born again. Most of the persecution was fortunately done by people who were not born again. It was done by nominal Christians. More tragically, however, after the Reformation, beginning with Martin Luther, you had people who said they were born again Christians or evangelical Christians or regenerate Christians who also engaged in it. But before Luther, there were really no major recorded instances of born again Christians persecuting Jews. It was always the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church until the time of Luther. Luther in the 16th century began as friendly to the Jews initially, but when they would not support the Reformation and, and accept Christ, he became vehemently anti-Semitic. Martin Luther was in most respects a man who began right, but ended quite badly. During the peasants' revolt in Germany, he said the peasants should be stabbed in the back. He said and did some terrible things. But he also said that every Jew should be hoarded into a corral and forced to confess Christ at the point of a knife, that the synagogue should be burned, and that the German people should murder the Jews to prove they are Christians. That's what he actually preached at the end of his life and wrote. Adolf Hitler quoted Luther extensively in his book Mein Kampf. Luther is the unfortunate exception. Luther definitely put evangelical Christians, or people who even said they were saved, on the course of anti-Semitism and Jew hatred. But before Luther, throughout all those centuries, it was not carried out by people who were saved. Saved Christians themselves during the Dark Ages and earlier were persecuted by the same people who persecuted the church. You had always, before the Reformation, there were born-again Christians in Britain and in Europe. In England, they were called the Lollards. They followed John Wycliffe. In Central Europe, they were called the Bohemian Brethren. They followed John Hus. Earlier than that, there were the people in Italy and France called Waldensians. In Spain and other places, you had groups called Albiginists. They were always born-again Christians for centuries, but they were persecuted the same way the Jews were by the same people who persecuted the Jews. It was not until Luther that people who said they were born again or said they were saved or regenerate or evangelical began to persecute Jews. Unfortunately, that has begun to change more even in the modern world, where seven out of nine evangelical bishops in Germany in the 1930s supported Hitler and the Holocaust, claiming to be Christian, saved Christian. Also today, there's a movement among people claiming to be born again, claiming to be evangelical, who are anti-Zionist. But when you lift up their anti-Zionism and look what's underneath it, it is simply traditional European anti-Semitism. The same as you have Christians in Europe today who are pro-Israel and see Israel fulfilling prophecy, there is a movement of Christians who are pro-Islamic, basically. They're sympathetic to Islam, even though Islam persecutes Christians, and these are very anti-Israel anti or anti-Zionist. Yet they claim to be born again. They claim to be saved. In the last days, the position of Christians concerning Israel will be one of the key issues, one of the key issues, that will separate the true church from the harlot church. The position on Israel will be a key issue that will divide true believers from the apostate church that will follow the Antichrist. I have no doubt. Israel is sort of a litmus test, a barometer. If a Christian is right about Israel, if a Christian understands that God has a prophetic purpose for Israel and the Jews, that does not mean that all their other doctrines are right. There are people who are Christians who love Israel who have crazy ideas. Some of them are going back under the law. Some of them are trying to dress up like Jews and wear yarmulkes. Some of them are going into Jewish legalism, like the Galatians. Being right about Israel does not prove a Christian is right about other things. However, being wrong about Israel 
proves they are wrong about other things. I have never found a single Christian author, theologian, or preacher who was anti-Israel, who was replacement theology, who were not fundamentally wrong in their other doctrines. One of Britain's most famous preachers died about a year ago. His name was John Stott, famous in Great Britain. John Stott was anti-Israel. He was completely replacement theology. But John Stott was also highly ecumenical. John Stott believed in all kinds of things, including annihilationism. He taught people that we can't say that there's a hell and an eternal judgment. If somebody is wrong about Israel, I can guarantee they're going to be wrong in their other doctrine. Today, it's the same thing in the United States. You have people such as Bill Hybels and his wife, a major church in Chicago, based on marketing. He is, they are anti-Israel, part of Christ at the checkpoint, yet Bill Hybels had an Islamic imam, a Muslim imam in his church. After the September 11th attacks in New York, he had a Muslim explaining Islam to people who said they were born again Christians. But he cannot find you a single mosque that will allow an evangelist to explain the gospel to Muslims. Again, Hybels is another example. When you find people who are opposed to Israel, I guarantee you they are also wrong in their other doctrine. I know of no exception. Israel is a litmus test. Being right about Israel doesn't mean they're always kosher or always right about other things. But if they're wrong about Israel, I can guarantee their other doctrine is fundamentally wrong. Another one is John Piper in America, a major Baptist. He's replaced in theology. John Piper is now endorsing Rick Warren's global peace plan. Rick Warren's global peace plan says we must unite with Buddhists, with Hindus, with Muslims, with people who worship other gods in order to bring in global peace. Now, the New Testament teaches no Christ, no peace. There's only peace when Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Moses called other gods demons, shedim in Hebrew. Paul the Apostle called other gods demons, the manoi in Greek. Yet Rick Warren teaches we should unite with people who worship demons to bring in global peace. This is the Antichrist agenda, and it's supported by people like John Piper, replacement theology. If they are wrong about Israel, they are wrong in their other doctrine. In other words, the issue is not Israel. The issue is the way they interpret scripture is fundamentally wrong. They get it wrong about Israel because they get it wrong generally. They have a general error in the way they approach the word of God. This is the reality in Europe today and the reality in Britain today and the reality in the West generally, including America today. Yes, to understand the history of anti-Semitism and Jewish persecution in Great Britain, in the UK, which was mainly in England, we have to understand anti-Semitism in the context of medieval politics generally. In the scriptures, Jews were a nation of farmers and soldiers. Their life, their culture was built around faith, family, and farming. And they were all soldiers. The whole nation was a nation of soldiers, as is modern Israel today. When they were driven from their land under the judgment of God, according to the curses of the Torah in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, they were sent into the diaspora to be regathered in the last days. But once they lost their land and came into Europe, if a Jew had a farm, his barn would be burned. His land would be confiscated in a pogrom. <laughs> Jews couldn't be farmers anymore. That's how they always made their living. They were forced into certain professions and certain livelihoods by anti-Semitism. They were forced to be merchants because they couldn't have lands. In the Middle Ages, medicine was seen as a low degrading profession because it involved handling blood. Who do we get to do a bloody job? 
get a bloody Jew. They forced Jews into the medical profession. In those days, it, the medical profession, of course, was not scientific. It was barbers letting blood out of people and things like this. But that's essentially the way that they did it. Jews were forced into medicine. Jews were always being accused falsely of ridiculous things, such as using the blood of Christian babies to make Passover matzah, and they were all these charges. They were forced into law to defend themselves because nobody else would defend them legally. They were forced into law and medicine by anti-Semitism. They were forced into merchant trades. But what happened in England and in parts of Europe, above all, was usury. The kings and nobility of medieval Britain and Europe used the Jews to carry out money lending for interest in order to reap taxation. They used the Jews as their tax collectors. They needed banking. They couldn't survive without it. But because of prohibitions against charging interest and usury, Catholics, Christians couldn't do it. Once again, who do we get for this dirty business? Get a dirty Jew. That's how they looked at it. Jews were forced to become moneylenders by the nobility and the royalty of Britain and, and Europe. The proceeds would be very, very heavily taxed by the monarchies and the nobility. They had no choice in it. But this caused the resentment of the Jews. They were fingered as, you're the merchants, you're the, uh, the moneylenders, you're the evil people. When in fact, they were forced into these things. They had no choice in order to survive but to do it. Well, the first pogrom that resulted from this was in the city of Norwich in England in the year 1060. That was the first major pogrom that happened in Britain, in England. In 1090, uh, sorry, 1190, a far worse one happened in the city of York at Cliff's Tower, where the Jews were essentially forced into a tower. It was set alight and they were murdered. Again, it was these anti-usury riots or anti-money lending riots, but they were forced to do it. A hundred years later, in 1290, under King Edward I, he was in deep financial straits, and he didn't see the taxation of Jews from the money lending as a high enough source of income. He needed the money all at once, so he expelled the Jews from England and took all of their wealth, any property, anything they owned, he simply took it. It was, again, financially motivated. That was in 1290. The Jews were not allowed to come back to England until the time of Cromwell. Oliver Cromwell um, was somebody who allowed the Jews to come back because he saw through the scriptures, it was pointed out to him, that the Jews would have to return to Israel from every nation, and he didn't want England to be left out. He also had certain financial and political interests to allow them to come into England from Europe. So until Cromwell, there were no Jews in England, and then Jews were allowed to remain in this country again. Anti-Semitism since that time has ebbed and flowed, but it never reached the levels it became in the Middle Ages. It never became that serious again until modern times. With the growth of Islamic immigration into Europe, you have a major problem in cities like Paris, cities like Rotterdam, cities like London, Birmingham particularly, where the anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism of radical Muslims is affecting the general social fabric. It's a strange situation. But the international media bias and the academic bias in universities is unbelievable.